So my name is Aaron Jones. Uh, I work here at the Chandler Police Department. Uh, however, I'm not representing the Chandler Police Department. I am a uh, computer programmer by trade. I write software. In addition to that, I do a lot of talking. And uh, I also run our Tuesday meeting, which is the Phoenix Linux Users Group Security Meetup, or as they like to call it, SLUG. Um, but let's go ahead and just jump into it. So our performance objectives for this evening. At the conclusion of our course, we'll be able to identify six out of six reasons why someone may want to be a hacker. We're going to identify and describe the four parts of the hacking timeline. We're going to identify and describe the three teams involved in hacking and their role. And then we're going to identify and describe tools used in the probing aspect of the hacking timeline. If you are interested in following along, you can go to Retro64XYZ dot github dot io and if you go to the third page in the results you'll be able to find introduction to cyber reconnaissance if you're on your device and want to follow along so what we really want to start with is why do people decide that they want to hack why are people doing these things and now hacking is not necessarily a bad term especially in here but we use it as an overarching term just for everything so the first reason is going to be fame. And Kevin Mitnick is a really good example of a fame-driven hacker. If you're following along, you can click on his name. It'll take you to a little article about this gentleman. But Kevin has been in numerous news articles. He's well known. Uh, he has had movies written about him, books. Uh, he writes his own books. In addition to that, he's been inside of uh, magazines as well as different blog posts. And he also sells a whole lot of Kevin Mitnick themed merchandise. Um, he really liked the idea of pursuing recognition. He wanted the people to know he was smart. And if you read about him, it's one of the things that got him in trouble. The next one that we're going to discuss is fortune. And this is monetary rewards for services rendered. This is bug bounty programs. And then, of course, it's also going to include criminal rewards. And Kevin Paulson was an example of a hacker who was driven by the drive of monetary gain. Uh, one of his big claim to fames, and something that he's very famous for, is there was a radio station that was going to give away a Porsche. And so what he did was he got into the phone system and made it so that the phones were tied up. Nobody could get called in. And then as soon as he made the assumption that it was his time to call, he would disconnect, reconnect to the phone, get in, and he did that a couple of times, and he ended up winning the Porsche. So using his computer, essentially, at home, he was able to win the Porsche. However, after winning the Porsche, he realized, hey, I'm pretty smart. Hey, I can do stuff with this. And hey, there's opportunities here for me to make more money. So eventually, he was found guilty of mail and wire fraud, as well as computer fraud. And uh, he also got in trouble for money laundering and then eventually other financial crimes. And he never really recovered like Kevin Mitnick did. Kevin Mitnick got in trouble, but he turned it around, made it into something positive. Um, he didn't let it stop him. Kevin Paulson didn't really seem to turn it around as well. Uh, and then, of course, the pursuit of knowledge. This is where we start using that hacker term in sort of a more positive light. Uh, some people just want to know how things work. They're natural tinkerers. They're interested in finding out what they can do with a device. And Richard Stallman is an icon of that traditional hacker culture. He's the guy that a lot of people think about when they think about a building out in California with somebody scaling the building to put a car on top in the middle of the night. These are the kinds of people that they're thinking about, just somebody who wanted to prove that they could do things, somebody who wanted to contribute. Uh, and of course, we all know Richard Stallman is also a proponent of freedom and has written numerous essays on his software freedom activities. And uh, he is a political activist. And then we get into political statements. And this is really important as well, because hacktivism has really recently reached the news as a method to rebel against issues real or imagined. And we can start with Gary McKinnon. And he's an example of a political hacker. And the reason why I say that he's an example of a political hacker is because he believes, or did believe, 
that the United States government was hiding evidence of UFO contact with this planet. He was under the impression that if he was able to gain access to US government computers, he would be able to find evidence of alien contact, pictures of aliens, so on and so forth. So what did he do? He decided he would hack into US military and NASA networks in order to investigate that. And for a little while, he was actually pretty safe because he was doing this out of Europe. And uh, even after the US said, hey, turn this guy over, it seems like Europe just kind of tried to push it as, hey, he's just kind of crazy. Sorry, we'll take care of it. But eventually, he did get sent over here. So I do want to make the comment, though, and I know it's not written down here, and I don't think we discussed this last time. But Gary does claim that he did find evidence of aliens in those government computers. So, <laughs> uh, however, he didn't produce any of that evidence, sadly. So, our last one is going to be criminal enterprise. And this is simply furthering the aims of a criminal enterprise. People are doing identity theft, they're doing credit card theft, unauthorized access of computers, they're selling narcotics, drugs, prostitution, all sorts of stuff using the computer now. A lot of crimes are moving from the physical realm where traditional law enforcement is used to that and now it's being moved directly onto the internet. Uh, Astra, and this of course is not this gentleman's real name, but Astra was a hacker and he decided he was going to go steal data from a weapons manufacturer out of France. So French Dassault Group, which builds weapons, missiles, all sorts of stuff, this guy decided he would get into their computer, which he did, and then he stole what they are claiming was $360 million worth of information that he stole and then caused that amount of damage to their company by him selling this information. Uh, now, of interest is the fact that even after being caught, prosecuted, and the entire case being finished, they never identified him, which I found that very, very interesting. Uh, I know that the laws in Europe, especially when it comes to crimes, is a little bit different, but for them to decide not to identify this person, there's not a whole lot of reasons why they would not do that. However, one reason is potentially he was underage, which would be extremely interesting to think that somebody underage would go and seek out French Dassault Group's computers, break in, and steal a whole bunch of information. Uh, and if that was the case, you would think that they would have talked about that. Now, there are rumors that he was a gentleman from India, but um, that hasn't been confirmed. I haven't seen anything online confirming that. So, I don't know. And then our last one is going to be for fun and laughs. And everybody's familiar with LulzSec, and we're all familiar with 4chan, and everybody knows about Infinity Chan and all these different places that people go to and they work together to do stuff with the computer. Whether it be doxing somebody by finding out personal information about them and then going and putting it on the internet to get them in trouble, uh, contacting their employer to try to get them fired, uh, buying a whole bunch of pizzas and sending the pizzas to them, or sending the pizzas cash on delivery and uh, in the hopes of making somebody pay for 20 or 40 pizzas. And then, of course, we also get to the point where people are also doing what's called swatting. And if you're not familiar with swatting, the idea behind swatting is, is you pick up the phone and you say, hey, uh, I'm super crazy, and I just killed my mom, wife, girlfriend, dog, whatever. Uh, if you don't send the SWAT team over here right now, I'm going to kill everybody. And by the way, when the SWAT team gets here, I'm going to kill them too. And then you hang up the phone. And that is also something that they've been doing. In particular, they do this a lot to people who do streaming online, like video game streaming. So if you get on to some of these web pages where they sit there and uh, stream themselves playing video games, you'll find that many of the individuals involved in that have been swatted. Um, because, of course, a lot of these people have things like PayPal accounts. They have things like um, donation accounts. They have all of these methods that require personal information about the user. And then, of course, if you have a method that has your personal information in it and somebody goes in and donates a dollar on PayPal, oftentimes PayPal sends them an address and says, oh, you just bought something from these people. Here's their address. Uh, this is where you need to do some sort of business with them. Um, 
And then, of course, people gather up that information and they send it out. Uh, just as an aside, and I'm just going to put this out there, I really do think that if somebody were to build a third-party tool for many of these donation systems that worked as a buffer between the person who was getting the donations and any of these financial companies, they would probably make a killing off of those individuals who are very worried about having their information out there. So I'll just put that out there. So let's talk about the hacking timeline. What's really going on when somebody decides that they want to be able to break into a computer or they want to gain illicit access to something? Well, the first thing we need to talk about is the reconnaissance stage. And that's where you're actually picking a target. That's when you're choosing what is the target. When is the best time to execute scans or attacks? Where is this target? And how should you attack? This is your planning phase. For anybody who's ever been in the military, law enforcement, paramilitary operations, anything like that, this is the exact same thought process here. You're choosing who's going to be a target. You're choosing how that person is going to be targeted. You're choosing the weapons used. You're choosing who to employ on getting the mission done. Um, and some people don't think about the fact that where the target is located can be very, very important because of the fact that for some companies out here, obviously, if you're trying to connect to their server from China and the server is located here in the US, what do a lot of people do? They have their server set up not to answer. They have geolocation IP blocking. So it'll say, hey, all of these IP addresses that come from China, just don't even answer them. So if you're attempting to make contact with that server, potentially you need to choose computers that you're going to use for whatever it is that you're going to operate on from a different place. Um, the next part is going to be scanning and probing. And that's when we start getting into the tools, techniques, documentation. What we want to know is what is running on the server. What is available? What are they doing with it? How often is it hit? Where is it hosted? We're trying to find out information that will help us. If this system is on AWS and they haven't taken the time to set up their AWS system, now later on when we get into infiltration and exfiltration, we may be thinking about the fact, well, we can actually denial of cache this server. Instead of trying to cover your tracks by using one technique, perhaps you'll go in there and have a whole bunch of connect computers connect to it and start downloading files off of it until you run up the bill on the AWS server and Amazon shut them off. Or you bankrupt the company. There's a lot of different choices. And so once you get into scanning and probing, and you start figuring out what's available on the system and what is being done with that computer and where it's hosted, that's when you start making those decisions about what you're going to do with that system. Infiltration. That's when we're looking for and exploiting vulnerabilities, bugs. We're looking for access to remote code execution. And oftentimes, this relies heavily on soft skills. You don't have to be Mr. Super Hacker. You don't have to be the guy who invented the way to use SMB for Eternal Blue so that you can run code on somebody's server. That doesn't have to be you. You just have to be somebody who can speak fluent English, pick up the phone, and talk to somebody and inform them that you're part of a penetration testing team who needs access to a username and password. And if you could just hand that over to me real quick, we'll be right on our way and you'll be right in business. There's a lot of things that people can use to get into these systems. Even telephones. A lot of people use two-factor authentication, right? Well, guess what? If it's a text message, people are already inside of the phone systems. If you're using two-factor authentication, it comes from a text, you're already, you should consider yourself owned. Yeah, we can all go on tour right now, and there are markets where they're selling access to the actual telephone, um, um, like the buffer between you and the telephone servers. You can gain access to that for a cost of about $500 if we don't go shopping around. And once you have access to that, anybody who's using two-factor authentication off of text messages, you can intercept those because you can just watch the messages as they come through. So that two-factor authentication method is done. It's gone. And in addition to that, people are passing that around out on Discord servers now. You want access to two-factor authentication? Great. 
Go make some friends. Once you've made those friends on Discord, there are people who share that information freely. So you don't even have to fork out your 500 bucks. You'd be surprised who has access to these systems. And then our final point is exfiltration and attack continuity. Are we going in slow and silent? Do we want to make sure that we still have access to the server later? Are we planning on coming back? Is there going to be a continuation of connections? Or are we going in smash and grab? Do we just grab whatever information is there, pull the whole database down? What? And then at what point do we just say, OK, this server's compromised. It's done. I don't want to end up with the FBI knocking on my door, so I'm finished with it. Because some people do look at that. So this is more of a business side. But we're going to talk about teams. And the reason why we're going to talk about teams is because many of us here are going to either work in some form of penetration testing. We're going to be working in some sort of cybersecurity related field in which we need to understand these terms. And I'm going to go over it. But in general, you don't really hear these terms thrown around by the people who are actually on the offense because it's not really necessary. Because guess what? You're always on the offense, right? But let's start with the red team. These are the team members who are going to be looking for exploits. They need to find the vulnerabilities. And they're looking for ways into a system or network. Now, they usually have rules of engagement. And those rules of engagement are set forth by the white team, or another word would be management. So your management is going to come to you and say, OK, look, you're on my red team. I need you to try to break into these servers. Here are your rules. You can't go to somebody's house at 3 o'clock in the morning and kidnap their kid and then pick up the phone and have the kid scream into the phone and then say, all right, give me your username and password and the kid gets it. That's outside of the scope of the engagement. Okay. However, you are allowed to cruise past people's desks, look for sticky notes, try to see if anybody's putting anything on their monitor with username and password. You know, Did somebody leave their RSA key out? These are important things that part of the rules engagement you're allowed to do. And for those of you who are laughing in the audience, because I saw a couple of you laughing, I want you to think about what was in the news just a little while ago. Somebody called a model, told her, come on down. We're going to pay you to take some pictures. And what did they do? Hit her with some ketamine and stuffed her in a trunk. And they were going to sell her for $320,000. So kidnapping, robbery, all of those things are not outside of the realm of possibility. If people are doing it in foreign countries, of course, here in the US, that would be a big thing, right? You would hear about that, and it would be a major deal. Now, over there in certain parts of Europe, it happens. And it happens pretty regularly. So our next group, the blue team, the defense. Team members here are usually going to be your server people, some of your developers. And they're, look at, they're looking out for the actual red team and their antics. These are the people who are well versed in the applications. They know how the network is built and functions. They know how it's um, going to function in terms of if they notice something odd happening, they can identify that. And they also follow an ROE on defensive actions. They have to sit there and allow these people to do what they're doing and then monitor it and look for ways of stopping them. Potentially, they may be told, don't try to stop them. They're going to be informed. Hey, just let it ride. We just want to see if they can get in. And then finally, white team or management. These are the people who are supposed to set the ROE, rules of engagement. Uh, these are the people who are going to know how the operation is conducted. They're going to set the rules. Uh, and they're the manager, management members who are going to not only monitor the event, but they filter the results. These are the people who are supposed to be able to take everything that the blue team did everything that the red team did, and then distill it down into something that they can provide to decision makers who are higher than them. Now, does it always work out that way? Obviously not. But that's the idea behind what they're supposed to be doing. So in an actual penetration testing system or in a uh, quote unquote legal hack, this is usually what you're going to see. One team setting up the rules, one team sitting there and either monitoring or defending, and then one group that's actually doing an attack. And of course, at some of these businesses, they're going to swap out. You'll have guys who are on the blue team, on the red team, back and forth. But now let's start talking about some of the tools. What's actually available? And the first one is going to be InMap. And InMap is pretty cool. It's a network mapper. 
And you can use this for network exploration as well as security auditing. And what are we doing with this? Well, one of the first commands that I have up here is going to be to allow you to perform an OS detection. Interesting enough, this can be used for OS detection, but something else that you can sort of think about as you're looking at these, if you scan a server, once you scan the server, try to think about what's being used on that server. What do you actually see running? If you see databases, look at what port those databases are running off of. If you see a web server, look at the ports. Uh, what's a real popular tool that you'll often find running on a Windows server that you won't find running on a Linux server? NetBIOS. What's that? NetBIOS, the 137. OK. What's, what about uh, some of their remote access tools? that they use for actually loading up a graphical user interface whenever you're interacting with a, a Windows server? The remote desktop, you mean? That's uh huh, the remote desktop. Okay. Oftentimes you'll see remote desktop running on a Windows server. Microsoft but, directory services. What's that? Microsoft directory services. There you go. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that when you're looking at it, you don't necessarily have to run something like InMap to figure it out. Once you've had enough time that you're starting to learn about the difference between a Windows server and a Linux server, what's being run, you'll very quickly be able to pick it up just by ports. Now, some of you are probably thinking to yourself, well, what if they're running a honeypot, right? They could be running something like Cowrie or a, a similar tool. And if they set up that honeypot, of course, you're going to be able to connect to it maybe over SSH after just a little bit of brute forcing, and then you're in, and oh man, this is a Linux computer, right? But really, it's just somebody's honeypot set up somewhere designed to take stuff, uh, you know, commands, gather whatever it is that you're doing inside of this system. Uh, I ran a Cowrie honeypot for a long time. I would say about four months, which in the grand scheme of things, that's pretty long time to have a honeypot on a single IP address. Uh, the things that I saw were individuals logging into the system and either immediately trying to run a script that would usually fail because they would brute force the system because it was essentially root and password and they'd get in and they'd run their little script and then nothing would happen. Or you would see somebody who got in and the system let them know that they were in and then they would come in and try to work by hand. And oftentimes you could see them trying to figure out what kind of system it was or doing very purposeful tests to find out if it was a honeypot. Because for many of these honeypots, they, um, they will return specific information. Like there will always be a very specific user with a specific user ID. So once they get in and they think that they have root, they're able to go in there and start looking at that. And they can say, OK, I know that this is a honeypot. And there's actually scripts that are written for that. Not everybody was using those scripts, which I thought was fairly interesting. Because if you've already scripted your attack, you would think you would just tag that on on the front. It seems like it would be a real easy thing. But not very many of them were. Here's another thing we can do. Just scan a range of IP addresses. Find out what's on the network. And of course, you can use notation. And then you can get real aggressive and do fingerprint scans with versioning. And we can find out what's available locally. Uh, I have a NAS. And sometimes the NAS, because of the, my router, has DHCP my NAS will get a new IP address, and I'll just real quick scan my network and figure out where my NAS is. There's good uses for every single one of these tools. I just want to make that clear. Like we're talking about some of the quote unquote more harmful stuff here, but there's still good uses for all of this stuff, okay? Mass scan. This is one of my favorites. And if you've ever heard somebody talk about, I scan the whole internet, this is what they're talking about usually. Mass scan is an amazing tool that allows you to do internet scale port scanning. And it's very, very useful for any kind of large scale survey of the internet or of an internal network. I use mass scan constantly. Love it. It's fantastic. Uh, if you want to scan the entire internet, looking for all the ports while using an exclude file, and we'll talk about an exclude file here in a second because they're very, very important. If you wanted to do it, that's the command right there. You run that command right there, it's going to go to every single IP address that's essentially in the world, try to connect to all of them, and then come back and let you know what ports are open. Um, it takes about 15, 20 minutes, depending on what kind of pipe you've got. Uh, oftentimes, people will take this and run it off of multiple servers, host it on different um, providers across the world. Like you'll grab a DigitalOcean account, 
spin up three servers, host it around the world, and then have this thing run. And then you can just slam the entire internet very, very quickly. But I have up there exclude file, and that's very, very important. And what your exclude file is, is it a file that includes like DOD networks, it includes Marine Force Recon, it includes all of the individuals who get a little pissed off when somebody comes knocking on their server, okay? And they do, believe me. If you run a mass scan over the entire internet and you just let it go after, off of like a DigitalOcean account, DigitalOcean will reach out to you because they're gonna get letters and they get them pretty quick. Uh, that exclude file is extremely valuable. And there's a whole bunch of them online. You can go to GitHub, type in exclude file, and you can find them on GitHub, and they'll include FBI networks, law enforcement networks, you'll find government related networks, you'll find all of our military, you'll find Chinese military, you'll find, and what is of interest to me, and consider me a little bit different, but I do feel, right, I'm, I'm a little bit different, sure. I do feel that when you create an exclude file and you put a bunch of IP addresses on it, guess what? That's the IP addresses that I wanna go look at. Like, yes, okay, cool, we have this exclude file that's out on GitHub that says, don't touch, this is DOD. Why would you put that online? Why would you just not, just not, don't answer? It's like when, you know, the guys in the shirts and the ties with the Bible come to your door and they knock. Just don't answer the door. Why would you open it and start a conversation with them if you don't want to talk to them? That's exactly what I see out of that list. That's your list of actual targets as opposed to hitting the rest of the internet. So we can even scan for specific things like a DNS server. Wanna go find all the DNS servers on the internet? There you go, right there. We can find every single DNS server that's reachable from the internet using that command. And then you have a list of targets for what? Denial of service, right? That's what people love to do. They'll go grab a whole bunch of DNS servers, denial of service, and then what do you see later? The entire East Coast wasn't able to connect to all these different web pages, right? On the news, everybody remember that from last year? That was a big hot ticket item, right? Well, there you go, that's how they found the DNS servers. How about traceroute? Traceroute's pretty neat. You can track the route of packets taken from an IP network on their way to a given host. That's all it does. Just tries to figure out where are those packets going and where do they stop in terms of where are they going to disappear into somebody's internal network. Um, it's going to try to follow it through each gateway. Trace route's pretty interesting. Sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's not. And then of course we have Wireshark. And Wireshark is the graphical user interface version of T-Shark. And so I like T-Shark. T-Shark is super neat. Wireshark is okay. Um, but you can interactively browse packet data from a live network or from previously saved capture files. Example, I decided that I would purchase a game capture card that was made by Aver Media. And it had an app on your phone. And that app allowed you to hit a button and the thing would turn on. You'd hit a button and it would start recording. And I thought that was really interesting. And I found that this thing had an API. It answered off of a certain, a certain port and it was curl requests, HTTP curl requests. So you could actually see when you'd hit the button, you could Wireshark it and you could actually see the request. This is the request that turns this thing on. Here's the request that turns it off. And it actually tells you in your app, your phone app, that you have to register for it to accept any contact from your phone. Well, that was a bald-faced lie. Because using Wireshark, I found out that if I just sent curl requests to this box without any kind of security or nonce or literally anything, I didn't have to register my computer to it, nothing, I just sent the curl request, it would just listen. So the entire app security thing where they made me make a username and password and give them my email and I was supposed to register to the device and it actually had like this rotating symbol to show you that it was working until at the end it said connected and now you could use your phone. All of that, total joke. It was just fake. It was just a spinny that somebody made in JavaScript probably tossed on there and 
everything else that I did with that thing I could do through curl requests. Wireshark's super neat for finding stuff like that out. You can also add name resolution. So instead of getting IP addresses, it'll actually try to show you names off of DNS. Uh, edit preferences, name resolution, enable network name resolution. It's a fun one. And then I've got some example filters. So when you open up Wireshark, you can actually filter up at the top. So I'm showing, like, we can choose an IP source and an IP destination. So if we know the destination and we know the source, we can add those. And then anything else that's happening on that network, we can ignore all of that. We can see just what we want to see. You can mass traffic. And then, of course, you can also view the man file for the filters. So if you go on there, uh, on the actual web page, you can see how to do that. The next one, of course, is T-Shark. I like this one because it allows me to dump all this stuff out much easier, or at least I feel that it's easier. I'm a command line interface kind of person. So we can read packets from these previously saved capture files. We can keep them. Um, for some of the people who are working on like that Aver Media device, because I was trying to get it to do something else, uh, Aver Media wasn't very respective to what I was trying to do. Go figure. When you're working with stuff like that, you'll often see people take these PCAP files and put them up on GitHub. So you can pull them down and you can compare them. You can look at them while you're working. Uh, I really, really like how that works. When you're working with Wireshark so that you don't have to run it as sudo, I've actually added the command so that you can add your user to the Wireshark group so that everything works without you needing to be sudo. And then I have a way of dumping to file. So we can T-Shark, dash I, choose our device, the one that we're monitoring, and then dash W, and then we can choose a name for our PCAP file and dump it out. And it's very easy. You just hit a button and let it run. It starts filling up the PCAP file. Do you prefer T-Shark over a TCP dump? What's that? Do you prefer a T-Shark over a TCP dump? Uh, I know a lot of people use TCP dump. I just use wire sh or I just use T Shark because that's the one that I'm familiar with. So you can use Who Is to look stuff up in the RFC thirty nine twelve database. Uh, throw on Who Is on there, give it a uh, a domain, and then of course let's talk about some of the web applications. So our web applications. There's a whole bunch of tools out there that we can use for being able to review, check, or actually execute the entire probing stage and reconnaissance stage of our quote unquote hack. These are really useful for gathering target data. You might want to look for weak links in the company, not only in their hardware, but their people as well. Again, we're going back to soft skills, but some of these tools here provide you the ability to not only look at their infrastructure, but to start looking at the people involved as well. First one is going to be Google dorking. Anybody here work with WordPress? I do. I have to for my job. If you work with WordPress or any kind of Drupal or any other kind of CMS, you're, there are very specific what are called Google dorks that you can type into Google to look for um, applications online that are vulnerable. So you can look for specific web pages. You can look for specific URLs that Google has been able to locate. And when you search for these specific URLs, you can find out if a, a WordPress site is vulnerable to a specific attack very easily, very quickly. In addition to that, you can look for specific versions of WordPress. If we know a specific version of WordPress is vulnerable to a very specific attack, well, guess what? You can look for all the people who haven't updated their copy. Uh, in addition to that, you can just go to Google and type in hacked by Free Syrian Army. Hit search. And the next thing you know, you have tons and tons and tons of web pages that have been defaced. And you can start finding the ones that have been defaced. And then you know these are all vulnerable to specific attacks. Google dorking is a very, very powerful tool. You can use it for people, too. You can put people's names in there. You can put their information in there. You can start searching for persons of interest using that. Uh, there is a tool called IP Logger. This is very popular for those individuals who are trying 
to uh, reveal who somebody is. If you go to the IP logger webpage, you can create a URL, and upon creating that URL, you can pass it out to somebody in a link, and when they click on it, they, you will be able to get their actual home IP address, okay? And once you do so, and you have a home IP address, for many of these individuals, they have access to people who work in tech support. They have access to people who work at some of these companies, and they're able to very quickly go in there and start putting that IP address to a home. Yes? When you say their at-home IP address, will, does, do you mean that if somebody's behind a proxy, that uh, this will get through the proxy? For some of these, yes, because it's using either Flash or it's using JavaScript to be able to do it. So for some of them, yes. For the one that I'm showing right now, you can usually, this one you can block using a tool like that. But for some of them, they do have like a little pixel length item that's been injected into the thing to get around that. But I'm not showing that one. But yes, it exists. Um, one of the ones that they're talking about right now is uh, there was a gentleman who said that he was the world's greatest terrorist. He was making little girls take pictures of themselves naked and send the pictures to him. You guys probably all saw it in the news. Um, he said that he told the FBI, you know, F you. You can't stop me. I'm the world's greatest terrorist. And they said, oh, OK. So they had a girl who got extorted by him. They gave her essentially a pornographic video to say was her. Didn't show her face in it or anything like that because it wasn't her. Told her to give it to him. And inside of it was a uh, small script that ran that got his IP address at home. And they were able to figure out that this guy was in California. So even though he was using Tor and he was using proxies and he was using VPNs and he was doing all of this stuff, they just sent the guy a video with a little uh, script in it that essentially reached out and touched a server that was only available to the FBI. And then immediately they knew where his house was. So Essentially they sent him an executable and he ran it. Well, it but the thing is, is it wasn't executable. What I'm assuming... What's that? How do you get a data file to execute something? Well, so what I'm assuming it was, was in the video, it was probably one of those videos that has metadata in it that needs to like acquire like an image. And so, of course. It's like an album cover. Yeah, like an album cover. So then the, the video itself inside of the you know, Windows Media Player or whatever it was that he was using reached out to a specific server to grab it. Yes. Well, there are also some applications that don't check their input very well. Uh, especially if they're coming out of the company in Seattle. Um, and so you can actually put uh, put exploits inside of the metadata at the front of a GIF or a JPEG, uh, and there have been exploits that have been around for years. Many of them are f fixed by filters when it comes in, but once it's on disk and the application opens it, there's nothing to stop it from doing whatever it does. Sort of similar to what happened with VLC, how people were making VLC attacks using... Um, Subtitles. I was just going to say, what about using like a VLC type player? Would that be immune to said activity here? Potentially not, because I'm fairly certain if you're using VLC, does, doesn't VLC still allow you to download like stuff? Like it'll offer to download things for you? I use MPV, so I'm not sure. I know you can do, give VLC a, a URL, or I'm, certain, I'm pretty certain you can. So potentially VLC would still do it. Yeah, but let's just say in your example, because it kind of intrigues me, let's say it was like a, what, an MP4, for example? Sure. This video, that this pornographic that, that had the payload in it, how would that MP4 have a payload? I'm, I'm kind of intrigued well, by it, this. It, it, it well, needed to the, download the cover arm. Right. So if you have something, if, if it's got metadata, if you added metadata to it, and it tries to connect out to a server that they own, uh, and they actually specified in the news article that that file was one that they created that was not distributed anywhere else. And when they gave it to him, the court level assumption is, is that he's the only person who has that file. So he opens it. It says, I want to connect to grab this picture. He lets it go. It goes out and it grabs you know, a cover art or whatever. And it, his IP address shows up from the house. Then he's done. Like they right, got he would have been that gullible to allow an outbound connection if he is the world's greatest terrorist. Well, I would assume, yeah, I was going to say, I would assume that the world's greatest terrorist probably doesn't tell people that. Yeah. Like, that's just the... Doesn't have that kind of bravado. Right. 
Uh, so continuing forward, what about social media? Things like LinkedIn. So something that I tell my students, because a lot of my students come to me and they tell me, hey, I'm looking for a job. And I say, great, have you applied for jobs? And they go, yes. And I say, okay, so did they call you back? And oftentimes they'll tell me no. And I'll ask them, so when you had a job that you chose, and then you had a company that you chose, did you go look that company up on LinkedIn? Did you go see what kind of culture that they have? Who works there? What kind of things they're posting to their LinkedIn? Are you paying attention to what kind of certifications that they have? What kind of certificates? What kind of education? Their interests? Those are the kinds of things that oftentimes I tell them, you ought to go on there and look at these people's social media and treat it just like you would reconnaissance for an attack. But instead of doing something malicious, you're trying to get a job. So you're choosing to put things similar in thought process or idea to whatever their jobs are there into your stuff so that you already match their culture. So when, you look, when they look at your resume, they go, hey, wow, this guy would really fit in here. And then, of course, in addition to that, people are using social media to look for soldiers because they want to go kill them. They're looking for police officers. They're looking for people who post what they're doing for their job so that they can add them to lists. Uh, a lot of the Al-Qaeda slash you know, Islamic terrorist groups right now, one of their big things is to go around on social media and find police officers to find uh, soldiers to find people involved in law enforcement and government and to begin building what amounts to databases about them. So of course you can use your social media for good stuff and then of course they're also using it for terrible things. And then court data and public records as well. Oftentimes people will go on there and they'll look for the guy who has a gambling problem, who's already gotten in trouble for it, who they know needs money all the time because that's a person that you can approach. That's the person that they're looking for. So for those of us who work in law enforcement or government or military, and we're all used to the, are you staying out of trouble questions, or do you have any kind of problems with drinking drugs or uh, gambling? They're asking those questions because those are very easy ways to gain access to somebody or something that they have. Yes? If you want to inoculate yourself from the LinkedIn kind of Pick up, just tell them you're a consultant. Okay. That, yeah. They'll run away. Yeah, yeah. So, let's get to vulnerabilities. If you do not care for your infrastructure, if you do not care for your applications, if you are not caring for the things that you are supposed to be taking care of, people are going to find out. They are using tools to very quickly locate systems that are not patched. They are using tools to very quickly locate systems that do not have updates. And they are exploiting those sites. In addition to that, we've already seen people are getting into the NSA stockpiles. They're getting into all those government grade weapons. They have access to them and they're finding things that we didn't even know existed. The idea behind an SMB exploit that essentially consists of an overflow in the buffer where they're able to actually execute code, that is a huge thing. And what amazes me is that those individuals, knowing it was such a big thing, actually sent that information out to Microsoft and told them, hey, we're going to release this in about six months. So you have six months to get this out in patches and get this onto systems. And who didn't patch? Can anybody think of a big name out in Britain who didn't do their patch? NHS, National Healthcare System? You would think out of all of the people who are spending millions of dollars on systems that are provided by companies like Dell and IBM and all of these other high security companies, that the NHS out of all of them would be one of them that were told, hey, you know how you turned off automatic updates? For a little while, turn that back on but they didn't. And not only did they not do it, they had six months of people screaming at the top of their lungs. I was running Python scripts not much long after they announced that this thing was coming out, checking computers to see if they were vulnerable to it. And I'm just a dude out here in Arizona. And what that tells me is in the entire 
British national healthcare system, there wasn't a single person who could run a Python script and say, all of these computers right here are super vulnerable and they're going to get popped in just a few more days. That's a big deal. And that's also not only a big deal, but that's also representative of a much larger problem for a lot of us. That's an issue that I see working in law enforcement and security is that even with all of these people getting up and saying, hey, update your computer. Hey, pay attention to what's going on in the world. Hey, watch the news. People are still not doing it. And they're not doing it in very, very big jobs, very high level jobs. Important people, if you will, are not paying attention. So what does that mean for us? Well, education. How about leadership? A little bit of attention to detail. These are the kind of core principles that we have to start pushing people to follow. Because if we're not doing that, and if we don't get people to pay attention to this stuff, we're going to have big problems. And of course, there's no assurance that you're not going to find a vulnerability. And in fact, if you find the vulnerability, and you're the person who locates it first, that's even better. That's great if you can locate it. But it's about preparation. How about backups? So when NHS got hit and they said all of these systems were down and they had no access to the data anymore, what does that tell us? They didn't have access to backups. They didn't have access to an IT team that could step in and fix these things. So what did they not have? Education, leadership, a little bit of attention to detail. All of these things were gone. You can't recover from many of these attacks today. Not only that, but they're getting worse. For a while, it was give us money, give us Bitcoin, and we will give your data back. It's not that anymore. Now it's give us money, give us Bitcoin, we'll give you your data back. Haha, -ha, just kidding, we deleted it all. They're destroying the data now. They're not even working towards trying to return it to people. They're just accepting the money. We need to make sure that people are prepared for these kind of situations so that they can actually recover. Because at the end of the day, eventually you're going to get popped. It's just a matter of time and when. There's one other issue with this, though. It's a fear of embarrassment. A lot of these companies refuse to get up and either admit that there's a problem or they refuse to let people know that there's an issue with their IT team because it is a huge embarrassment. Where has all this money go? What did you do with all the money spent on training? What have these people been doing? And then you come back and you say, well, actually, we weren't prepared. And we weren't ready for any of it. And oops. But now we're going to need more money. And in addition to that, we want legislation. And we want people to say that they can't use VPNs, and they can't use Tor, and we're going to take away all of this stuff because we can't take care of our own business. Look at what's going on in Russia. Look at Europe. Look at all of the things that are happening where they're outlawing VPNs, they're outlawing Tor, they're outlawing the tools as opposed to just working under the expectation that potentially something bad could happen, but there are ways to protect yourself from those issues. Uh, let's touch on education for a second. If you get people to start thinking in a security-minded manner, they will do it. I have an example here where I talk about a pen testing team that actually went into a company and were attempting to gain access to the company, physical access. They wanted access to one of the rooms. And every single person they passed let them go. The police officer at the door, the guy in uniform with a gun, he let them in. Once they got in through the door, they were able to talk to people in the IT team. They were able to talk to people in leadership positions. They were able to talk to line level people. They talked to a whole bunch of people and got past every single door until they met an inquisitive secretary who walked over to them and said, who are you guys? And they couldn't answer. And she said, you have to get the hell out now or I'm calling the police. And guess what? 
the company gave that lady a paid vacation and a whole bunch of money because she was the only person on the entire company's team who actually stopped the penetration testers. Not even their IT team stopped to talk to them. And that just tells you how far you can get with a clipboard and an angry face. Throw an angry face on, grab a clipboard, and you are in just about anywhere. Why an angry face? Because they won't stop you because they don't want to talk to you. Oh, I see. No one wants to talk to an angry yeah, person. Yeah, nobody wants to talk to an angry person. Look serious. Look like you know where you're going. Stomp. Walk with a purpose. They won't stop you. But we have to lead by example. If you're the top brass at your company and you've opened up a social media account and you're releasing all kinds of improper information on every single channel that you possibly can, what good does it do for you to get up and tell your subordinates, hey, stay off that Facebook and stop telling people about our merger? If you're already posting it to your LinkedIn that I'm the person that spearheaded this merger and I'm super cool and I can't wait till we start working with company so-and-so, because guess what? Somebody's looking at that and they're going to pretend to be company so-and-so. And they're going to call your payroll office and they're going to say, hey, if you don't want this merger to fall through, you're going to have to send us $50,000 in cash right now. You have no choice or this whole thing's going to fail. And guess what? The people in payroll are not going to let the company fail and they're going to send out the money. It's called whale fishing, if you uh, aren't familiar with the term and you'd like to look it up. So what do we need to do? Listen, ask questions, find out what's going on. Watch the news, understand these things, provide education to your line level people, but don't leave it at the line level. Bring it all the way up to the boardroom. Everybody from top down needs to be security orientated and they need to understand what's going on out in the world. And the final thing I want to cover is attention to detail. Thoroughness, accuracy, every task. If you are not paying attention to what you're doing and cultivating a culture of doing it right and doing it right the first time, you are going to have a problem. If you're going to make backups, great, make backups. Backups are a fantastic tool. But if you're making backups on the exact same server that's hosting the tool that's available to the internet, well, guess what? When that server gets popped, there goes your backups, too. Now they're both crypto lockered. You have to pay attention to what you're doing, why you're doing it, and where information needs to be. Um, in addition to that, let's get into regular reviews. We need people to start reviewing what they're doing. Every six months, sit down and find out, are we still doing it right? Does it still make sense? And is this what we really need? Practice. Anybody ever hear the old saying that making the backups is easy? It's finding out if they work or not that makes me sweat. Yeah. We can all hit the backup button, but is it actually going to function? Are we going to get that information back? Well, yep, the restore. Make your list, make your plans, conduct a review, and continuously review. Uh, for those of us who are computer programmers, what do we do? Continuous integration, right? We have a system that as we write code and we push it up to the server, it's reviewed, it's tested, it's checked for vulnerabilities. We have all of this continuous integration. Well, guess what? As system administrators, you can do the exact same thing. Spin up your server, spin up your backups, and then make sure the backups work on a regular basis. Test them. I don't know how many times I've been on web pages like Reddit or other places where somebody has been like, well, we tried to spin up our server today and the whole thing exploded and I didn't know what to do, so we tried to do backups and we just found out we didn't actually back up any of the you know, SSH keys or whatever and we don't have access to anything and I guess the whole company's screwed and so on and so forth and everybody's in tears. Go check out Reddit's, um, what do they call it? Uh, tech support horror and things like that, post after post of people who have screwed up backups. So what are my final recommendations? Well, number one recommendation is going to be use Linux. Why? Because you should use Linux. Develop yourself a physical security plan, an actual plan. Write it down. What are we going to do? What happens if X happens? What happens if Y happens? 
How do we prepare for things? Start getting into the mental exercise of preparation. Develop your data security plan. Where do I save these things? How are they protected? Are they going to be encrypted? Who has access to these encrypted backups? What happens if the IT guy explodes? Do we still have access to everything? Also, Mark, down why you need to know this. Sure. Because part of document management is getting rid of stuff you don't need to know. Yep. And that's part of your review process every six months. You look back at things and you decide, does this still make sense? Do we still need it? And then we get into document the business processes and review them for vulnerabilities, figure out why. And finally, foster a security positive culture. Cybersecurity in general is a negative sum game. If I find something that's broken, that's great, but guess what? Now you're, you're liable for it. You have to fix it. Everything that I do as a cybersecurity expert costs you or your business money. It's going to cost you money in programmers, it's going to cost you money in insurance, it's going to cost you money at some point. And so what do you see? A whole lot of people who don't do these things. They don't pay attention to it because guess what? It's cheaper to try to sweep it under the rug. Look at OPM. We talked about it Tuesday, but what was OPM doing? They knew somebody was in their network. They have admitted to it. We knew somebody was in our network. So what did you do about it? Well, we just left them there because we didn't want to bother them. And we weren't sure what they were doing. So we took a hands-off approach and hoped they would leave. Yep. Just waiting for the guy to leave. That's like telling me, well, what happened at your house? Well, this burglar kicked in the door. And he had a gun and a mask. And he had a bag. But it was cool because I didn't see him taking anything. So I was just letting him cruise around the house in the hopes that he would just leave. Because it was better than like getting involved with that. They had a zero dollar budget for cybersecurity. They had nobody who could help. And at the end of the day, when the one guy who actually got up and was like, hey, there's a problem here, but I don't know what to do and we should probably hire somebody. They said, nope, no, nothing. we don't have that in the budget. And so they just let it ride until a contractor came forward and said, hey, I just found your database out on the internet and like literally everything's there. And then they were like, well, I guess we need to talk to people now. We should probably pick up the phone and make a phone call. And it only gets worse from there. And we talked about this on Tuesday. But uh, so thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate it.